Thank you for joining us today for uh, Visual Storytelling in Casco Bay, a conversation with NAC Factory. Hi, I'm Sarah Lyman. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator at Friends of Casco Bay. And uh, we're gonna begin by just saying at Friends of Casco Bay, we work to improve and protect the environmental health of Casco Bay. And this year we're celebrating 30 years of working with all of you to help keep Casco Bay blue and we're really thankful and excited for that. So I would like to welcome Will Everett, our communications and development director and host for the evening. Uh, Will is passionate about the Bay and sharing why our work is vital to the community. So he's the perfect host for this event. And Will, you can take it away. All right. Well, thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I'm host for the day. I'm host for the Bay. Um, I want to thank uh, everyone for joining us and thank um, NAC Factory for making this event possible. And also thank TD Bank as our sponsor for the evening for making this possible. Uh, my name is Will Everett and I'm the Communications and Development Director for Friends of Casco Bay. And I'll be your host tonight. I know some of you probably were hoping for Kathy Ramsdale, our Executive Director, or Ivy Pranyoka, our Casco Bay Keeper, to be the host. But hey, I've got to earn my keep too. And I'm psyched that you join us, uh, joined us for tonight. It's going to be a fun night. Um, and uh, we've been celebrating uh, Friends of Casco Bay, our 30th anniversary. Uh, all year long. And if you're uh, new to Friends of Casco Bay, uh, we um, protect the health of the bay through uh, collecting scientific data about the health of the bay. Based on that data, advocating to reduce pollution and um, reduce the impacts of climate change. And uh, we also meet our mission through engaging you. It takes a community to take care of the bay. So thanks for your help. And uh, we wanna thank our members and our volunteers and our donors and our community partners and all those who helped make uh, it possible for us to be here for the past 30 years. Um, you helped us reach the really significant milestone. So thank you. Tonight, we are gonna show a short documentary film that NAC Factory made for us. And then I'm gonna have Alex Steed and Lindsay Heald from NAC Factory uh, join me on screen for a conversation about storytelling and filmmaking. And then you will join the conversation um, through chat, asking questions uh, that Lindsay, Alex, and I uh, will do our best to answer. So without further ado, let's uh, get the show rolling with um, showing, working with you to keep Casco Bay Blue, the short film Knack Factory made for us. Casco Bay is the beginning of the wonderful islands of Maine. We count up to 365 in our calendar islands. The work that Friends of Casco Bay has done and continues to do is vitally important to us. I think about future generations. It takes a long time to steer the environmental ship. We use a resource and that resource needs to be maintained and minded just like the roof on your home. They're on the mission on a 24-7 basis and it absolutely impacts the environmental and economic health of the Bay. I've been very fortunate to have lived on Casco Bay most of my life. As a young child, I send a bottle with a note off Bub's Hole at the top of Casino Beach and it was picked up by a school teacher in England so that made me realize that Casco Bay is part of the global oceans. Every day I run along Casco Bay there's something new that I see. There's never a day I take it for granted. All my life I've just been a water person. It's like my place and I know that that's true for many Mainers. I'm sort of like the Lorax of the Bay. I speak for the Bay. As Baykeeper, I get a lot of information in from other people in addition to what our staff observes. And then I use that information to improve and protect its water quality. What I've seen are the impacts of climate change. The changes in storm intensity, the sea level rise, the changes in water chemistry, the changes in the shift of species, what's here, what's moving out. 
that's been the biggest threat. The world is becoming more and more dependent on small community-based efforts and organizations to make the change happen that we've got to see happen. The work that we do at Friends of Casco Bay shows us that climate change is right here. We have expertise in collecting water quality data, and we don't just collect that data for the sake of science. We have always used that science to talk with our community and advocate for better behavioral practices and regulations and laws that will continue to help improve the health of the Bay. It doesn't feel like a lot that we can do globally right now, but we can do a lot on a local level, and that's where this work makes a heck of a difference to me. It's a way of feeling hopeful in, in the face of something that is really a wave of daunting, irreversible change. Anything that you can do in your lifestyle that reduces your carbon and nitrogen footprints, those are really valuable things to do. We're willing to try to find the expertise and then have the hard conversations with people about how are we going to move the needle together on improving the health of the Bay. We don't do this work alone. I'm always uh, more excited about our work every time I see that uh, film. And I really want to thank Knack Factory for making it happen. Um, you may have uh, seen that film at one of our earlier 30th anniversary events, or maybe you saw it was featured at the um, Maine Outdoor Film Festival. We also submitted that uh, short documentary to the Wild and Scenic Film Festival in California, and we hope to hear soon about whether that, uh, whether they'll be showing that. So now I would love to ask Alex and Lindsay to join us uh, on screen. Um, Alex Steed is the uh, partner and producer of uh, Knack Factory. Um, and I met Alex in the late aughts or the early tens of this century, back when we were both involved with the League of Young Voters. Um, and uh, Alex is a social media and storytelling guru. And he uh, is also the co-creator and co-host of the podcast, Why Are Dads? Um, which I love. And uh, so welcome aboard, Alex and Lindsay. We were young when we were part of the League of Young Voters. And we were young, a little younger. I had a little more hair back then. <laughs> and Lindsay, Lindsay, you were the brains and much of the brawn behind the film, our film. And uh, Lindsay was uh, the producer and she's a producer and photographer at Knack Factory. And, and uh, as you all just saw, she specializes in documentary shorts. Welcome, Lindsay. Thanks, Bo. So let's uh, get started here. Alex, how did you get into filmmaking and storytelling? Uh, I was working at a company. Uh, actually, I was working. I was working at Opportunity Maine uh, ten years ago, which was a, 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 a progressive non. It eventually became a progressive nonprofit, and I was a, a part of that community. And my now business partner Kurt Grazer and I had been hired, he was in a, a commercial video production and we'd been hired by a friend of mine to go and capture his family history in New York. They had sort of a storied history and they wanted, to, wanted us to capture this. Uh, he was 91 years old and an activist. His name was Alfred Moldovan. And Kurt and I got along so well. We'd known each other for 10 years beforehand and we got along so well and really enjoyed the process of uh, figuring out how to tell stories. And I really enjoyed the, the process of, you know, taking my expertise in communication strategy in one way or another and, and uh, telling visual stories that we spent the next couple of years trying to figure out how to formalize that relationship and uh, keep doing that. And now here we are. Cool. So same question to you, Lindsay. How do you get into being a filmmaker, storyteller, photographer? Yeah. Um... I came at it from a photography, documentary photography standpoint from college. And honestly, you know, I took some classes in video editing, but I didn't really know that it was going to be part of my life until I applied for the first ever Knack Factory internship in 2015. And in the interview, I said, look, I'm a photographer, but I, I haven't really been given the opportunity to, to work as a photographer. Like I'd love to take more photos. And they said, okay, that's great. Do you know how to use uh, Adobe Premiere, which is video editing software. And I was like, yeah, kind of. And then from there on, it was kind of just like, well, you're going to be doing video, sorry. So <laughs> that's what really cool. hired I as think, an intern. Uh, yeah, I think photography really like helped me 
you know, form a lens and for a video, but, um, but yeah, that was, that was how I came to be um, in video and in Mac factory. Yeah. And it was really uh, cool seeing your eye on, as you made our film and uh, you worked probably the most closely with us, Lindsay, at, at spending a week with our staff and our volunteers uh, last fall, uh, making this short film. And what, what were some of your impressions of making that film and working with our staff and volunteers? Um, I mean, you all made it extremely easy. Um, you know, not to say that, that some people are difficult, but it's just that um, it just seemed like you were really on board with our vision and there wasn't a lot of like conflict involved. You really like trusted us and in, in how we set out to make this film. Um, so that's always cool when your clients trust you and want you to do what you do best. Um, and, and from there, you know, you really helped us figure out the cast of characters, which is sort of the part that we need the most help with because you know, you know your audience and you know your constituents best. So that's kind of where you came in and then um, tagging along to, to all these different fun areas that, I mean, we always love when we get to film outside. So um, going out on boats and throwing the drone up in the air, like those are some of the best times in the main, you know, fall and, and summer. So uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Well, so, you know, Lindsay and Alex, you guys made a film for us. So. Uh, what I wanted to do tonight is return the favor, and um, I put together a short montage of the week that you guys spent with us um, back uh, last uh, September and October, um, and uh, as a way to thank you, and also as a way to thank all the people that helped make this uh, short documentary possible. So uh, bear with me for a second as we run this short behind the scenes Montage. Four minute film Knack Factory made in honor of Friends of Casco Bay's 30th anniversary was created from hours and hours of footage that Lindsay Heald, Thomas Starkey, and Tayden Brown recorded over a week spent with our staff and volunteers and in September and October of last year. The week began with a 5 a.m. flight aboard a Cessna with Lighthawk volunteer pilot Jim Schmidt. Thomas attached GoPro cameras to the wings and tail of the plane so we could get some aerial shots of the bay. Here's a cockpit view I had sitting behind the pilot. There's nothing like seeing the calendar islands of Casco Bay from the air. Hey, look, I think I see my house down there. The next day, we filmed Hillary and Tony Jessen taking a sunset cruise aboard their beautiful sailboat. A mechanical breakdown kept us from using the Baitkeeper boat as a filming platform. But the show must go on, so Thomas commandeered this tug from Handy Boat and Falmouth so we could get vessel-to-vessel -vessel shots. You can just make out Tayden in his flannel shirt as he films Hillary and Tony. Much of the footage of the bay that Knack Factory got was through the use of their drone. I was completely mesmerized watching Thomas expertly make this little whirly gig go up and down and all around. We spent a lovely afternoon with Joan Benoit Samuelson, a longtime board member of Friends of Casco Bay. Joni is also a master gardener and baskeeper. By the end of the week, the Baitkeeper boat's mechanical problem was fixed, and Thomas spent the day with our staff aboard the RV Joseph E. Payne. Here's Thomas filming the now famous shot from our film of Kathy slowly turning her head and smiling near Halfway Rock. So we send warm thanks to Knack Factory, and Lindsay and Thomas and Tayden, and the Jim Schmidt and the Lighthawk team, and Handy Boat, and of course the volunteers in our film, Hillary and Tony Jessen and Joan Samuelson for making this film happen. You are all among the best friends a bay could have. That's so, so nice. <laughs> we have not seen that before for people who are watching. So that's, that's so nice. Well, it, it was really awesome uh, hosting you folks for a week. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, Lindsay, you, I mean, literally you had days and days worth of footage. I mean, how in the world do you boil that all down? You know, when you're making a, a tight documentary like that? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to say that that 
there's a lot of, of waste of time or effort, but when you do get into the editing room, like it's like becomes really clear, like what are the, what are the dynamite shots and like, what are the golden gems of audio? Um, and so I, I don't know what the exact ratio is, but I mean, when you capture anything for documentary, like you want to get at least 10 times as much as you need or something so ridiculous because um, it's hard to know going into it, like what, what the exact storyline is going to be. And that's, that's why we kind of excel in that, in that arena is because we've kind of figured out like, well, if we just kind of capture it all and then bring it all to the editing table, we're going to be able to make something out of it and it's going to be great. Um, so it's just kind of having that like listening here and, and understanding um, what is truly the, the, at the heart of this story and, and who told it best. Because we, we ask the same questions of all of our interview subjects, but um, each of them answer them very differently. And, um, and that's why we do that because somebody answered at question A best and somebody else answered question Z best. And that's how we kind of string it all together. And our, and our team our team has been together. Uh, you, Thomas has been with us since before we were officially a company. Um, Lindsay's been with us for five years. Uh, Tayden, we've worked with on and off uh, for a number of years and he's been with the company for a couple of years. But um, something that I don't think our team is necessarily aware that they're doing when they're doing it is they've worked together so much and they've produced so many stories that I think they internalize when they hear or when they see these things that are going to show well or sound, sound great in, in, a, in a piece. And when they come together to edit it, it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a collaborative process. And so they all kind of have that memory that they're able to bring into that process and, and make sure that all of the highlights that they individually remember uh, uh, come out. And they, and, you know, it's kind of like storytelling is kind of like a muscle. Um, and these, these people, you know, the people on my team, I'm, I'm so proud of and impressed by, they, they hone that muscle all the time and it really shows in the, in the end product. Oh, it's, it's really cool seen uh seen you take all that footage and and really boil it down and you know take all of our all the things we we're saying and be able to make a, a a nice kind of story out of it it's really kind of amazing the process and uh so about your work with with knack factory i mean this has been a crazy year uh we hope to show this film um back in april at a big 30th anniversary event we were going to have it was going to be the largest in-person event we've ever held but of course the pandemic happened uh so we're here and doing these uh zoom events how has the pandemic affected your work at knack factory well it was it was uh it was devastating um we spent the past two years uh, branching out of sort of exclusively local work. And we still do a, a great deal of local work. About 50% of our, our work is, is in the state or in the region. But we spent the past couple of years getting um, larger national clients where we were flying to location, sort of you know taking on productions that were a week, two weeks long. Um, and that had become over the past couple of years a major part of our growth. And, and we were thrilled with it because uh, it's really easy to be competitive on the national stage with the main cost of living. And it was great for Maine because all these companies are sending their money to the state, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, un unfortunately, obviously, uh, travel is not so much in the picture yeah. anymore, um, for, for a, a while at least. And um, so we're trying to figure out like how to kind of, you know, recalibrate the kind of jobs that we're doing. The, the benefit to that actually is that the jobs that we were doing that were national um, um, cost us a lot more than jobs that we do locally. And so we're able to, you know, while, while we took a bit of a hit with the amount of uh, incoming work that was, that was coming in or the size projects that were coming in, we were certainly, um, um, you know, focusing on more local projects and that's been beneficial to us. We, we were lucky, um, you know, because a lot of our work has to do with companies that have global supply chain, uh, uh, global supply chain, you know, a, a, a foot in the supply chain. Um, we were able, I think, to see COVID coming uh, a lot earlier than I think a lot of other people were. And so we were prepared when it came time to uh, uh, apply for the PPP. And, and we were very fortunate in, in that we were able to uh, uh, put that use, put that to use for us. But we, you know, it was, we were, you know, 
pardon the pun, we were dead in the water for yeah. at least a month, a uh, month and a half. And we were very lucky to uh, uh, be able to reconfigure. And, and now we're, I think, in a lot of ways, stronger than we've ever been before. And that's awesome to hear. And it's, uh, it's awesome when a, when a local company of yours makes good at the national stage and is making good surviving through this craziness of us all. But besides the pandemic, um, you know, you're, you're working with thousands of clients helping to tell their stories over the years. So has there been, that's kind of what's the most challenging experience separate from the pandemic as a filmmaker or storyteller, what's the most challenging experience you guys have had? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely been um, many different types of challenges, um, but I think, I think the focus on something uh, recent um, was a, a studio shoot that we had that is for a holiday campaign that's not even out yet. Um, but it was just five days notice that we had that this, that this client wanted this to make the shoot happen. And of course we wanted to, we also wanted to make it happen. Um, but there were just so many elements that needed to come together uh, to, to make it happen in just five days. Um, so I wonder if we, we should actually probably just play that clip first and then I can talk uh, a little bit more about it. Yeah, sure. This is so a, cheers. <laughs> yes, cheers. <laughs> uh, so um, just to be clear, your most challenging film experience was making a that that uh, kind of a cocktail commercial. It was not the most challenging, Will. It was just the most recent <laughs> one that I could think yeah. of. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I also just thought it would be fun to show something that's complete opposite of what we did for you for you all, um, which is a stop motion commercial about alcohol. Um, one but, of the things that one of the things that Lindsay has said to me in the in the recent past about about challenges and something I didn't even think about because I don't go on these I don't go on most of these shoots is a lot of our a lot of our bonding as a company happens on the way to and at shoots and you know we spend I joke about it it's true you've seen it well uh, from this yeah. production you know ninety percent of our time isn't necessarily shooting it's problem solving. It's you know, waiting, spending time, spending time together. And that's how we, that's where a lot of our communication happens as a company. I'd, I would say filling that gap has been one of the most difficult pieces of the past year is the fact that we don't have those opportunities for person to person uh, uh, connection. That's been the hardest thing at Friends of Casco Bay too, during this whole thing. I mean, that's what, what kills about this whole, the whole pandemic besides the fact that it is literally killing people and it's like yeah. we can't see hang out with each other either mm -hmm. um but you and you you folks are running a business but you guys obviously have a heart too you know you there's causes that matter to you besides friends at casco bay obviously or is there a favorite nonprofit or cause that that you guys have worked with lately um yeah we've gotten to work with several nonprofits this year um a few were uh United Way of Greater Portland, which you're going to see a clip from, and um, Indigo Arts Alliance. They uh, they had planned to put on an inaugural uh, children's book festival this year, and it was supposed to happen all throughout the summer. And there was going to be like uh, in person uh, book readings and like carnival games and uh, I don't know, a bunch of like fun street fair type of stuff going on. And of course, none of that could happen. So then it's like, how do you make a children's book festival virtual? Uh, we filmed a dozen different books in our studio. And then I had the great honor of a Zoom or Skyping with all of those authors in, across the country. And they read the book to me as I recorded their audio. So we matched up their audio with the the books and that was a really 
sort of like once in a lifetime experience, like having actually Brian on a beautiful blackbird on the other line, um, reading me his, his book. That was really amazing. So that, that, and, and, um, or when, so my, my heart, my, my wife is a professional musician and obviously, I mean, her year is, is everyone's year is shot in one way or another. Musicians are, as far as, as far as sort of professional work goes are, are of the most affected. So um, early on, and we're very close to the Portland arts community. And so early on in the, in the pandemic, um, we worked with as many people as possible to try to figure out a way to safely raise money for musicians as well. And we had a, um, you know, essentially what was a virtual five day festival that we worked with AV Technic on to, to beam out of Thompson's Point. And we worked with Bissell Brothers in order to do that. And um, you know, we I think we raised for the for the bands involved. I think we helped facilitate uh, uh, you know six six somewhere between six and seven thousand dollars to pay um, uh, uh, ten bands that otherwise just weren't going to see any cash transactions and, and maybe maybe haven't since at least by way of playing music. So you know, we in addition to working with nonprofits, which are very close to our heart, we also work with Maine Coast Fishermen's Association. We worked with United Way Portland. I think as Lindsay said earlier figuring out any way that we can utilize our resources um, in a way that, that gives back to the community, not just as like a cynical, you know, marketing ploy, which I think yeah. is often how people quote, give back to the community, but as a way that really gives back to the arts community that makes what we do possible. I mean, we, we do that. Yeah, and then we, we have uh, the short that you made for uh, United Way. So let, um, towards the beginning of this pandemic. So let's, let's show that. About eight weeks ago, I would say things started changing on a daily basis. Now we're creating standard operating procedures that are, how do you provide really great service from six feet away? Within two weeks, we were able to triple the number of ICU beds we had, and then we spent the remainder of the time really caring for those patients. These different industries came together to try and help solve problems in support of ultimately healthcare. I think Greater Portland is just a wonderful community, and we've got the right people with us in this journey. What was it like make, working with uh, United Way on that? Yeah, so that that was um, just like a 30 second social media clip for a longer four minute video we made for them, um, completely remote. Like I interviewed all those folks um, over Zoom and they all submitted footage uh, via Dropbox. I filled in with a couple of, of clips on my iPhone um, and yeah, it was it was amazing because I, I before that I had no idea we'd be able to create a video just sitting at my desk. Um, so yeah, it was it was it was a pretty powerful thing. It was called their love letter to Portland, and it included something like forty different area businesses and nonprofits. Oh, that's incredible. Well, we're, we're getting uh, time flies. It's already been half an hour. Um, we're getting close to uh, Q and A time, but. Um, the thing I wanted to ask you both, because um, I, I love dabbling, taking family photos and everything. I mean, these days we're all we're all storytellers and and filmmakers. We're all carrying around these, you know, supercomputer cameras in our pockets uh, and sharing stuff to social media platforms. What advice do you have for us amateurs um, on trying to capture uh, our experiences or capture better video experiences to share with each other? I mean, I, I think the biggest issue for all of us, whether photo or video, is just getting getting those assets off our devices, right? So um, regardless of whatever you're creating, I would say like get a hard drive and back it up because the next time you go for a new phone and you think everything's gonna transfer and it doesn't, like we've all had that moment where I thought it was all in the cloud and it wasn't. Um, so that would be like my number one takeaway is just having a place where it's stored and organized, not just 2020, 2019, 2018. Um, but for video in particular, the only thing I can say is that when you're filming with your phone and if you actually do want to make something with it later, you might want to like flip it horizontal so that it actually plays on a television. Because um, if you're always filming with your phone in vertical, then it's not really fun to watch or to show other people unless you're showing them on your phone. So that those would be my two quick tips. How about you, Alex? Um, I just think, well, I, I think one is, uh, like I said before, 
so much of, I think the magic of what we do on our end is pretty banal when you see it happen. It's, it's waiting and it's problem solving. <laughs> and so, and so a lot of, a lot of it is just a matter of making sure you're in proximity to where the story is going to be. And then knowing, being ready to capture the story and being ready for the story. Um, in, in the other, I saw someone just ask a question and I know we'll address questions in depth later, but I saw someone ask a question about equipping people with microphones in order to, to get clean audio. Any, any little thing you can do to, um, um, you know, go above and beyond what people are able to do when they just hold their phone like this, like, uh, if maybe you can capture audio separately on another, on a, another device or you, even something as simple as we've learned this year from spending all this time on Zoom, making sure your lighting is set up in a way so you don't look like a ghoul as I do if I'm, if I'm uh, lit from above. You know, any, any little detail that can help uh, uh, take it beyond just pointing your camera at something uh, is, is helpful. But, you know, lighting, sound, uh, being ready, uh, and, and also, you know, Lindsay has been the best at this at our company and trying to hold our, you know, hold us accountable to make sure that we do this on a regular basis. Looking at stuff that you like and determining what you like about it and then trying to figure out how to emulate those things. That's great advice. That's great advice. And, it, and you know, a lot of us are sharing stuff, our little stories and vignettes and videos and photos and stuff uh, on social media. And Alex, you're you're a prolific tweeter, but you've, you've kind of come to have a love-hate thing with Facebook these days. What, <laughs> what makes a social media platform for you kind of more appealing or less appealing? I, would, I mean, I would say if, if uh, any place where you can connect with people in a way where it, it feels like it brings you value. And I think like a lot of people, I mean, I think Facebook is, is useful because it's one of the most used platforms by, um, especially by people of an age who spend money. Uh, that's, it's still extraordinarily helpful if you're marketing or, or trying to send a message somewhere. And especially if you're trying to mobilize people to support something or buy something. Uh, so Facebook is still very helpful in that arena. But I think I'm like a lot of people who, who would look at Facebook, wonder why I was there, feel existential dread, you know, watch people argue with each other. Like it just felt bananas. It didn't feel, if it didn't feel fun or redeeming. And so, and then also just with all the data stuff, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I like Twitter a lot because I'm able to connect with people and, and learn about people and, and find out resources and, you know, uh, articles I didn't know about, see videos, et cetera. I, I dabble poorly on TikTok, but I watch a lot of videos on TikTok, really mm -hmm. like that a lot. And, um, um, you know, Instagram is still helpful in some ways, even though they just, um, you know, a couple months ago uh, changed all the design and layout and it's absolutely counterintuitive to use, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, well, time flies. So I'm gonna invite uh, Sarah Lyman, who's uh, been monitoring the chat and uh, come on in and so lob some questions at us and we'll do our best to answer them here. Hey, Sarah, welcome aboard. Hey, thanks. Um, yeah, if you have any more questions, feel free to put them in the chat. We'll check back there um, as well. There are, you know, in the line that you were just talking, Alex, um, about some of the technical pieces, like someone was asking, it, what kind of video camera was that? Is that a Canon lens I saw? Hmm. Um, and then some more questions about the audio too, but maybe we can start off with, do you know what cameras you use to film this? Our video? Lindsay. Yes, uh, Canon C300 Mark II is our primary camera. Um, we have a couple other Canons, uh, but yeah, that's, that's primarily what we use. And then the um, DJI, DJI Mavic Pro 2 was the drone. I think that's all we used. <laughs> Okay. Um, and then uh, folks had questions about kind of the, the story, storytelling that you were able to do. So they were asking if the audio was scripted and we touched on this quickly earlier, but they asked if the audio interviews were scripted or are they more spontaneous Q and A. And the second question was, Oh, did you consider like having folks come on camera and talk rather than like a voiceover kind of setup? Yeah, so it was not scripted. Um, 
as Will said, we we shuffle through hours of footage and audio um, to pick out all the things that they said. Um, I know what I want them to say because I'm, I'm typically the person interviewing and I was in this case and what as well. So if I'm not getting what I want, I'll just keep rephrasing the question until I do. I, I don't plant things in people's mouths. And, and if I do need like a little connection piece that I'm missing, I will say, you know, if this is true to you, do you mind repeating after me? But I do not do that very often. And it's usually just like a transitional piece. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, we've, we agreed on an outline and we kind of knew where we wanted to wanted the story to go. So rather than have people read something or coach them to read it until it sounds like they're not reading, which, which can take even longer, we decided let's go with um, unscripted interviews. And then the reason to go the voiceover route as opposed to the, the sit down interview, um, we've been going more and more with the audio only interviews recently because um, I think it's it just comes down to comfort. It's like just easier for people to sit down in front of a microphone than it is three different lights and one or two cameras and then three people behind those cameras. Um, so I, I think with doing the video portraits um, where Kathy turns and looks at the camera and you see her title, like that's, that's how we're introducing people now in video. And, and I think it's a more organic way than having someone just sitting in a chair and, and looking across camera. I think that's still like a like a long time topic of any sort of news or any, you know, it's still gonna be used forever, but um, in, in our more documentary work, I think that, that it's, we're going in a more direction of, of just the voiceover. Yeah, when we, when we um, were talking to you about this uh, 30th anniversary film, a few things that we asked, well, we, we don't want a bunch of talking heads and you totally got rid of the, you got rid of it. You have the talking, but no, the, not the heads. So that was really cool. Um, and then the other thing is that we wanted to make sure it was an honor, honor of our 30th anniversary, but we didn't want to be super looking back. So although I think in all of our interviews, we probably talked about a lot of about what we did, but you really kind of heard and focused on what we are doing, you know. So that was that was really cool. And someone's just asked how much of the story outline changed throughout this process. And, you know, I was more removed from the process, but I think, I think it stayed pretty close. Is that true? Yeah, um, it, it didn't change all that much because we stuck with our four characters. I mean, we were going to have um, two folks internally with Friends of Castaway and, and two folks who were sort of like friends of the Bay. Um, so, you know, the only and the biggest hiccup, and I know Kathy's in here, is is when uh, when she was ill for a while, and this is late last fall, um, and she didn't want to be <laughs> interviewed because her voice is a little hoarse, and I don't think you even notice it. I'm sure she does, but um, that was sort of our only hiccup, which was, do we go for it for today, or do we wait another couple days? Or, but in terms of storyline, nothing, nothing really ever changed. I thought her voice carries the uh, the 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 heaviness of the the work that we're doing pretty well, even if you know that it's kind of not quite exactly Kathy's normal voice. Did you have to do anything with the sound of, of her voice? I mean, she was really hoarse. <laughs> yeah, no, we we didn't really. I mean, we get, we like fed her plenty of water during the interview, but uh, yeah. no, no. Other than that, we didn't we didn't alter her voice. Yeah, we try we try to go into these 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 videos knowing what points we're trying to hit right going in and then we we flesh those points out with the the conversations we have with the people who are going to appear and then flesh them out with the the visuals um almost i mean based on so the the production process happens in pre-production which is the planning beforehand production and then the post-production which is when we put everything together and usually through pre-production we know more or less what the message is going to be and and how we're going to convey it um, you know, it's, it's a relatively rare occasion that it doesn't go according to plan, but I, I love that our team, like, you know, you had talked about the, the, the vote didn't work. And, and one of our biggest, one of the things I love the most about our team and I love working with our team is they're extraordinary problem solvers and always do it 
with a smile on their face, with a, like a legitimate smile on their face. They're very good at solving problems and then just being like, well, this is just a part of it. And so um, uh, in Thomas is, <laughs> Thomas is just like an exemplary problem solver, especially when it comes to the water. So, um, you know, there, there are times that we have to pivot, but that's part of our skill set. And, you know, uh, we, there's, <laughs> there's, over the years of uh, working in video, you always run into, you know, you're working with a potential client um, or, or you're talking with someone about doing work and they let you know that like, you know, their nephew has a camera and maybe he'll shoot it instead and they won't have to pay him as much money or whatever. And you're like, well, okay, so when a problem happens and you're not able to carry through with that, you can then come back to us. And that's something that will, will help you work through because, because at the end of the day, I mean, I think we tell great visual stories, but the rest of it is in planning and, and problem solving. That's something that we do pretty well. And, and we, we talked in prepping for this call about one time when we were shooting a commercial shoot and uh, the whole purpose of doing, of, of doing the shoot was to show off a beautiful family vacation to sell like baby pro, you know, sort of like baby and family products, and and uh, the families together having a great time in Cape Cod. Uh, Mar Cape, was it Cape Cod? Martha's Vineyard. Cape Cod. And uh, uh, we got there, and it was a four-day storm in the middle of the summer, and so we had to completely restructure the shoot in order to do that. So we go in planning. Ninety percent of the time, it works out. Ten percent of the time, it's catastrophic. But we're very good at facing catastrophe with a smile. On the, on the catastrophe with a smile thing, I just had to mention uh, Thomas commandeering that boat from Handy Boat. But so our, our boat broke down and, you know, we need another boat. Thomas, this is a classic only in Maine story. Thomas <laughs> knew the bay pretty well because he worked through high school and college at Handy Boat. So he just ran over to Handy Boat and he operated this tug for years and years and he hasn't worked there in how long I don't know how long but knew where the keys were ran through handy boat told yelled to somebody that he was borrowing the tug and then all of a sudden you know he comes around the corner uh in this uh handy boat tug it was I mean only in Maine can you have someone with a connection like that <laughs> where you're able to get a, another boat you know at the drop of a hat it was kind of amazing I love that guy. Yeah. Uh, so, all right. I so, mean, that is the benefit of having time. I mean, the whole team has lifelong or at least decades long ties in this state. And, and so shooting here, I mean, our, we're, we're able to usually come up with solutions that we don't even know we need at the time, but we're able to pull them out. Yeah. Well, uh, we're a little bit over time, but I'll take, how about Sarah, one more question and then we'll, we'll close it up. Uh, let me insert here. Folks are asking where they can see the film, and it's actually on the homepage of our website. So if you go to cascobay.org um, and scroll down just a little bit, you will be able to see that. Um, and let's see. Uh, someone asked, uh, you know, Alex, you talked about pro bono work versus in discounted work versus self promotion, and was wondering what about Friends of Casco Bay catches your attention. Well, I know uh, Will, obviously, and that, that's very helpful. I've known Will for years. I mean, trust is substantial. And, and um, Mary Cerullo, I, I know, and I saw, I saw Taylor, Mary's uh, granddaughter in the stream here. So it's, you know, a bit of a friend and family affair. And so uh, um, that is helpful. Uh, <laughs> but, but that's the kind of the first step. And then assessing the, the mission of an organization is really substantial. I mean, in, environmental work and any work that is meant to slow the catastrophic, uh, um, you know, speed and, and intensity of, of, you know, climate change is extraordinarily important to us. And those things are most important. I mean, v values and relations are huge, but are not everything. Um, we got, you know, we got approached by Beautiful Blackbird and, and their mission of, of um, uh, literacy in particular for children of color uh, uh, efforts was substantial and extraordinarily important to us. Um, so those, those are the big pieces. And then the biggest piece that Lindsay has helped me be disciplined about, because I used to just be like, we'll do anything. And that is cool until it gets in the way of you doing good work. Um, um, does it help us tell a story that's fun to tell and interesting to tell and that we wouldn't otherwise have an opportunity from corporate clients? I mean, our, our corporate clients have a pretty, you know, 
slim uh, uh, slim level of adventurousness, let's say, and and our, our pro bono clients from from you know musicians to friends of Casco Bay to you know people we do heavily discounted work for, uh, they often just trust us to to do our thing as long as it aug augments and amplifies their thing, and that that's the best kind of partnership. Cool. Well, we are thankful for your partnership, Alex and. And Lindsay, thanks so much for uh, working with us. And uh, well, th thanks for joining us at this event. And uh, my final comments for the evening, uh, you know, thank you to everybody who helped uh, Friends of Casco Bay get here at 30th anniversary. Uh, and if you uh, want to help Friends of Casco Bay, there's a few ways you can do it. You could volunteer. If you're not signed up to be a volunteer, you can go to a website and do that. You can make a donation. Uh, if you're already a volunteer and already made a donation, you can make a donation, another donation to our Climate Change in Casco Bay Fund uh, to support our science work collecting data. We have less than $50,000 to raise out of a $1.5 million goal for that fund. And then if you've done all three of those things, uh, the other way you can help uh, Friends of Casco Bay is um, to tell a friend about us because we love when friends of friends become friends of Casco Bay. So, well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.